Hi, this is Deborah Atkinson, and you're listening to the More Than Calories or Fat webinar. And what I'm sharing with you here is the impact of so many other things. I think we can all agree that when you're looking at weight loss, that it is so much more than about weight loss. It is about the things you find. It's about your confidence. It's about you getting to the 100% of you that, that potentially isn't there right now if you're staring at weight loss. Not that you are what your body weight is or what the scale might reflect or the clothes that you pull out of the closet that pull on. I don't want to minimize you to that and please don't take that comment as condescending. But it is a big piece of how we feel in the skin we're in, how much we love the body we're in, that is important. So if you're here, you are on that side of feeling like you're not at your optimal weight. You're not at your optimal energy. And the biggest point that I want to get across today is that there is a huge difference in the way you successfully approach losing five pounds versus 20 or more pounds. So I'm comparing five and 50 pounds in many of the blogs and podcasts where I address this. But I want to get this very, very clear that there is a difference. Losing that last five to 10 pounds is so much different than losing 20 or more pounds. And I'm going to give you the why to that right here. So it's so much more about calories or fat in so many ways on each side of the equation. That is me, Deborah Atkinson, and I do not put that there for a, hey, look at me. But what I frequently hear on presentations is, I thought we were going to see you live. <laughs> and, and then, of course, I couldn't be in my pajamas. But just to let you know, um, all disclosures made here, I am in my pajamas. <laughs> so as I work at home, a lot of times I work best early in the morning. So that's what I'm doing. However, I want to let you know this is the person behind the scenes. I'm 53. This was taken when I was 53. I think sometimes that's clear that some of us are using old, old images and, and not so much true. Actually, my neighbor took this very recently. So I want to go into talking today about what's important when you're looking at weight loss and why you may not have been successful in the past. So super important to me, and I'm going to scroll through. Number one is the mindset. So I'm really going to tackle this in so many ways. It's the mindset of how to exercise, but it's also about what kind of exercise works and why you're exercising in the first place. And that has so many layers. When we talk about why, it's Many times right now you're being asked, you know, what's your why, what's your big motivation? Because it's not just about the weight loss. Maybe it's about getting ready for a class reunion. So even then, it, there's a why beyond that. Because you want to feel more confident. You want to be able to say, hey, look at me, I've arrived. So maybe it's a little bit of a status. Maybe it is an ego stroke. But I think there's such a fine line between ego and than feeling good. So a lack of confidence versus too much confidence, I think, can get misconstrued. They often show up in the same way. So nobody, least of all me, is judging you know where you're at or your motivation, but just wanting you to find it because that's the most important piece here. But I'm going to challenge your mindset in so many ways about weight loss and the approach that we typically take being diet, and exercise. And, you know, by diet, the past may have meant you were on a diet. But what I'm really looking at is your permanent diet. What is your diet habit, your diet lifestyle? And in terms of exercise, you know, we are often looking, um, as well as diet, at burning more calories, burning more fat, or we're looking at, you know, trying to take in fewer calories and I'd like to shift that to better calories or taking in less fat. And actually, the shift needs to be there to taking in more potentially better fats for you. But beyond that, you hear all of that in every single weight loss program. What I really want to challenge is that it may be your brain 
that you need to eat for, change your diet for, that you need to think about your brain when you think about how you're going to exercise. Because if you do those other tangible things like dieting, going to the store, preparing the right food, doing the right actions, and the scheduling the exercise, doing the exercise even better, you still may not make the connection that has to happen in your brain for it to be permanent. So, you know, out there by yourself, raise your hand mentally if you've ever started a program and then dropped off of it. I think we can all probably agree that's true. That's the importance of mindset, and I'm going to jump right into that. So here's literally what we are going to cover. I want to cover, you know, the discussion about weight loss and the difference between 5 and 50 pounds. You should be very clear on that difference and why. Based on the brain difference, the muscle difference, the fat difference, when you have significantly more weight to lose, and and though I have 50 here, it's because I just like alliteration, the F and the F, the, the 5 and the 50, but it could be 5 and 40, and it actually can be that tipping point is probably somewhere between 15 and 20 pounds, more significant weight. That's what you want to look at. We're going to talk about the food and the exercise and what difference they make in each one of these things and the importance of daily habits. We're going to touch on that as well. So from top to bottom in the images, you're, you're going to see mindset is on the top. The food that you eat plays into the mindset that you'll have. The exercise plays into the mindset that you'll have. So starting with brain building kind of an odd sense of words that I'm using right there because typically when we talk about weightlifting or we talk about cardio, less so, we talk about bodybuilding, right? It's really what we're talking about. I want my arms to look better. I want my thighs to be better. I want my waistline back. And those things can all be true. But we don't talk very much about brain building. It's not very sexy for, for number one, so we've really got to learn a little bit more about it. It's more a fear-based kind of a thing. Most of us, when we start paying attention to the brain, it's because maybe a parent has dementia or Alzheimer's and you're fearful that might be happening to you or you've got more brain fog because you're a woman at midlife. Too many things are going on. Too many things are on your plate and your mind and you're trying to commit so much to memory or you have a past history of doing that, which can hurt memory central for you. But I want to talk about, you know, this is an image here on the left of a Flipping 50 TV episode uh, about self-sabotage. So if you've done that in the past, you may want to check that out. It's on flipping50.com. And that I think is episode three, three out of, you know, our first two seasons of episodes were 26. That means I think, uh, the message I would take away or hope you took away is it was really important because no matter what else happens, if you get on the bandwagon, fall off the bandwagon, that's not my goal. You know, I want participants and clients to be high maintenance so that we can go through it all together and get through the weeds and then get to the other side, you know, mowing it all down and <laughs> having a weed free garden there. What you eat affects your brain. And how you exercise affects your brain. So our old ways of thinking potentially of, you know, well, I exercise so I can eat this are gone. You know, in our toxic environment, they're really gone. And what we know now about sugar, you know, is like, you know, once you've gone all the way, you can't go back to holding hands. We know too much, you know, that things, all things in moderation is not working. It's causing disease. And the level of disease has not really gotten any better. And the level of exercise for health and certainly for fitness has also not gotten any better. We're still looking at maybe, you know, 70 to 80% of people not exercising as much as they should to impact their health. So if you are one of those people who is or is trying to, Realize that you're you're going to go up against external resistance from those people who are not adopting that lifestyle. 
as well as your own internal resistance and know that's normal. There is no show of a lack of discipline or lack of willpower if that's you. But there are things that we can do to increase your brain power so that you will more favorably make better decisions all day, whether we're talking about getting rest, whether we're talking about uh, making better choices at lunch, or talking about making a better choice about getting out of bed a few minutes early so you can get the exercise in. Without the right brain building components, those decisions will be harder to make. You'll make poor decisions during the day. So diving into brain matters, and you're going to find, oddly enough, that as a fitness professional, you may have come here and said, I need, I need to know exactly what's the fat burning exercise I need, what's the cardio exercise that burns the most calories and fat, and you thought, I was just going to give it to you. Well, if all of that worked, you wouldn't be here. Because for 30 years, 34 now, I've been in the fitness industry, and we've been giving that information, and it's not working. What we're missing is the six inches between our ears in two ways. We're actually missing the change in the brain chemistry that changes your hormones. That is really the exciting piece that I've been studying 24-7, 365 for the last four years. The pieces have been there. I just didn't know what those answers were and how to put them together prior to this. And now we've got so much more research about it. But the other piece is, yes, behavior change. We need some more help. But I'm a strong believer that women, we want to know the why. Why are you asking me to do this? Why should I be do this? Why should it be important to me? How will it help? And when we can connect those dots, we're so much more likely to do the right thing. So let's look at this list here. So it's kind of an odd list. They don't, all these things don't go together perfectly. But women are more susceptible to depression. Women are more susceptible to anxiety. And addiction takes hold faster on women than it does on men. And women are more prone to Alzheimer's in part due to the depression, the anxiety, but it's also the way we have this monkey mind. We have busy minds. It makes us really good at some jobs and detail-oriented kinds of positions, but it also makes it really hard for us to shut it off. We have that chatter all the time, not just when in project management, say at work, you know, we think about, okay, well, don't forget this. Don't forget that. This needs to happen. And that's where, you know, our strength is our weakness. So in terms of Alzheimer's, committing all of those things to memory, constantly thinking about those things and not being able to help it can make us a little bit more prone to Alzheimer's. Now, that doesn't mean you're going to get it, even if genetically there's some predisposition. Changing what you're doing can impact that significantly. So the bottom two, serotonin and GABA and cortisol. I want to address those and how they help you fight off depression, anxiety, addiction, and, you know, eventually dodge Alzheimer's. Serotonin is our feel-good hormone. We have that. Men have a little bit more dopamine. Kind of that's their counterpart. They also have serotonin. We have less of it. We produce less of it than men do. And during midlife, when we are, unfortunately, more susceptible to the negative effects of stress. And let me tell you that women are, throughout their lives, when hormones fluctuate, we're more susceptible to negative effects of stress and cortisol. That means from the moment you go through puberty, every month when you have a period, when you go through the period of prenatal and postnatal, postpartum, and then never is it more significant than at menopause because that's the biggest change and why it's quote unquote the nickname, the change, is there. We are more susceptible than men. Just we have more hormones, that gift that just keeps on giving. You didn't know you signed up for the monthly subscription. You got it anyway. Lucky. Boom, boom, boom. Right. So jokingly, yes, but when our serotonin levels are low, 
that's depression. If you if you've been on an antidepressant, either because of situational need, you know, life changes that we go through, maybe in a grieving process or something else traumatic happened to you, often you're given SSRIs, and they're basically serotonin serotonin um, inhibitors. So you're given that they work less well at midlife than some other um, antidepressants do. And so if you've been on one for a long period of time, finding it's not working, it, there may be a time for a change, and I'm certainly not diagnosing, but worth a conversation for any of you who feel like you need it. But I also want to give you something else. Because the goal, I think, for any of us would be, let's not be on any kind of pill, you know, if we can avoid it. And exercise can be a great complement and or substitute if you can wean off of, you know, the support that you might be getting from a chemical drug because you can create more serotonin with exercise. Strength training is really emerging as a huge benefit for decreasing anxiety. It's always been used and studied for decreasing depression, as is cardio. But weight training is pulling out ahead, and there may be reasons for that. We may simply be studying weight training more for older adults and its impact on sparing muscle losses to keep strength, keep stamina. But we're also seeing this other positive side effect in the brain effect, in the mood effect. And there's also GABA. There are certain things that we do that prevent GABA or decrease GABA, and it can happen as we age. So GABA is a supplement. You can take it that way, but you also, by exercising, by stopping you know, alcohol, sugar, some habits that decrease your GABA, stopping those and starting exercise, we can change potentially if you um, have too little GABA, you're more likely to have anxiety. So looking at what can we do to make that work a little bit better for you, starting weight training, make sure it's a quality program, and starting a cardiovascular program, and it doesn't have to be extreme on either one of those cases. Mind-body exercise, also important. We're going to talk a little bit more about that, but you can see the image I selected here was weight training on purpose. And whether you go for the heavier or for the lighter, or you feel more comfortable or safe, or you feel vulnerable using the heavier, either one of them can work and begin to create benefits for you. Cortisol. So I've talked about the stress. Stress and depression, you're more stressed, you're going to be depressed. Stress and anxiety, of course, go hand in hand. Addiction, women just tend to be more prone to it. So I want to talk about that. I'm not talking about cocaine necessarily or or some other kind of drug, but you can become addicted to a lot of things, certain behaviors, you know, right? And be be a little bit more OCD to shopping, to gambling, to spending money. And they can take their hold and we don't see them when you're in the throes of addiction. We don't see it. So these are all ways that Exercise can help with these brain matters. And here's the connection. If you're depressed, if you're anxious, if you're in the throes of some kind of addiction, you can't make good choices. You can't make good decisions. We don't do it as well about our exercise, about our lifestyle habits, about our eating, our food choices. So you've got to get that brain healthy in order for you to function really well. It, it may not be at all a matter of willpower or of discipline or a lack of it. It may be that your brain simply doesn't have right now the right chemistry to help you make those decisions or didn't in the past. So a different approach to a better answer. Let's talk about this scale, all right? We can't talk about weight loss without talking about this elephant in the room, because unfortunately, this has always been the measure that we come back to. And as much as I love to think as a coach who works online with clients, when I work with you, here's what happens so very often. We will be making great progress. And then you'll say, you know, because I felt so good and because I'm sleeping so good and 
the weights are getting easier. I thought for sure I must have lost weight. I jumped on the scale and I didn't and lost any weight. And did you hear what I just did? <laughs> A little dramatic and I'm an Aries, so I can do that. But the point is you, you may go through three or four things that are giving you the indication you're on the right path and you actually feel really good. But then we give the power up to the scale because it says, no, you haven't lost any weight. Even though the inches are changing and your clothes are feeling better and you're getting compliments, we just have to scale up, meaning we have to measure something else. It's important that you're measuring fat loss versus weight loss. And, and I say that in two ways, literally and figuratively. So literally that means getting a body composition test or having a scale that will tell you what your body composition is. So that in fairness, if you're going to ask the question, what is my weight? You ask the question and get the answer, what is my body fat percent? Because if you lose weight and what you're losing is muscle and up to 50, 50% of weight loss could be muscle if you're approaching it in the wrong way. That will come back to bite you in the you-know-what or wherever it is you store your fat. In your hips, your thighs, your butt, your belly, your upper arms. Did I just hit them all, right? All those pain points that we've got. Make this go away. Make that go away. That's where the roller coaster of you lost weight at once on a diet, maybe in your 30s, and then you regained it and then some. If you lost weight, you lost a percent of both muscle and fat, but when you gained weight, you gained probably 100% fat back. You don't, kind of out of the blue, spontaneously gain muscle. Now, if you're lifting weights, you may gain some lean muscle mass as you learn to spat, so your scale won't change as quickly. And that's really the benefit of scaling up and measuring both, as well as taking measurements. Let's... Let's measure your calf and your thigh and your belly and your hips and your chest underneath your bra and your upper arm. And let's look at what's happening there. Let's pull on the clothes that maybe feel a little snug, but that you love and would love to fit better and use those things as evidence that you're making progress. That's really scaling up because that darn scale, pardon my French right here, cover your ears, but she's a bitch. She lies. She does not tell the whole story. So you've really got to get away. And I know that's hard <laughs> to have had a habit, you know, for 30 or 40 or more years and not default to it is hard, but you can do it. All right. Let's talk about your fat. What's the difference between fat when you've got significant amount of weight to lose and you only have five pounds. The big difference is the amount of toxins stored in your fat. You're gonna have more weight loss resistance, meaning it's gonna be harder to lose weight. I know that's clear, but I just wanna be sure we say that. If you have more weight to lose, you are storing toxins. Whether that came from the fact that you've been drinking out of bottles of water, really thinking you're doing something healthy for yourself. And now we know, you know, even drinking out of plastic water bottles, the plastic leaches into the water. So we've been doing that for years, thinking, okay, this is a healthy habit to hydrate. We also have been doing some damage along the way. If you have been ever microwaving foods and at one point, We'd buy something at the grocery store and we'd microwave the food in it, peel back the plastic and not good, right? So some of those types of toxins were absorbed. Sitting in front of a computer screen, I'm doing it right now. There are toxins coming out, you know, and emitted onto our body. The significance of different screens is worth mentioning. So your cell phone on your body if you don't have something magnetic on the back to block that, you're absorbing a lot of things. It's related to prostate cancer in men who carry their cell phones in their pocket or on their waistband, so please don't do it. If you are a woman who runs with her phone for a music source or, pod or safety, right, or podcast blasting, don't put it in your bra pocket, right, if you're concerned about breast cancer, and aren't we all? Don't put it on your back if you're a biker. 
put it in your backpack on your bike. Keep it away from your body. And those things are really important. And, and I just say those to list a few. So anything you breathe in, you eat, you drink, anything in your immediate environment, the air quality in your home. And you may think, well, of course it's good air quality. I live up here in the mountains. It's got to be good. Well, but what if I have upholstery on some furniture that I'm not aware of the contents of, right? So even those kinds of things that maybe we haven't considered, we've got to consider your shampoo, your body lotions, all of those. We are exposed constantly to toxins, And the more aware you are, the more you can stop doing it. But you do have some residue, most likely from things you've done in the past before you knew what you didn't know, right? So now we have those lodged from research that studies cadavers, right? We know that the toxins are stored in fat, you know, from years and decades prior. So it does make it harder to lose weight. So you've got a certain obstacle there to overcome. So approaching fat loss has to be much more calculated and careful so that you're not just losing muscle and so that you feel good while you're doing it. And then the second thing here is sugar versus fat burning. You know, if you're typically approaching dieting and exercise on a low calorie diet and maybe you're going to a low sugar, fake sugar, artificial sugar sweeteners so that you have low calories, You potentially are adding more toxins, number one, confusing your body and your metabolism, but you're also still increasing the chance your body is a sugar burner, burning immediately what it's given as opposed to having to dip into fat stores. There is a specific way to teach your body how to burn more fat with an easier exercise and higher intensity exercise. What they say about interval training is true. But if you only do interval training, we'll be in trouble and at risk of increasing that cortisol, the stress hormone. So it's finding a balance of, yes, it's appropriate to do high intensity exercise that's easy on joints, but it's also important to do some exercise that is not constantly beating up and tearing down the muscles or increasing cortisol so that you can become a fat burner as opposed to a sugar burner. And then what's also important is timing the right food and the right exercise together. With high intensity interval training, for instance, your body will burn more carbohydrate. So actually starting with a little carbohydrate prior to exercise, along with a little fat or protein, will actually help you burn more energy during, which means after, you will still be burning more energy. With lower, slower activities, your body tends to burn more fat. So if you give it carbohydrates, it won't do that. So it's a matter of learning what do I eat before exercise and when do I eat it and when don't I eat certain foods. So let's talk about training and the steps that are involved. So training the brain, number one, really right before training the muscle. So going right to, you know, training the muscle, not so much, but training the brain does involve the exercise and the brain as well as changing the thought process. So there's a little bit of homework that is, has nothing to do with movement or with cooking and grocery shopping or planning the meals and recipes. It's about making a shift from, first of all, having the right science. So you've got to have the right information. People that I work with go wrong in two ways usually. Number one, it's having a bank vault full of wrong information that makes it really hard when they get in their head, they've decided I'm changing. They're running really hard in the wrong direction. So if you're still defaulting to the old idea, the science that you learned 10 and 20 years ago, chances are that you're not going to be doing hormone balancing exercise that will help you lose the fat permanently. Because right now, your body is just saying it's not working anymore and it's amplified. At midlife, all the mistakes that we used to make just won't work anymore and they're going to be amplified for us such that you may find that what you did for weight loss is actually causing you weight gain, in fact, fat, fat gain or bloating right now. 
So the mindset is about having the right information right now and building the brain before you even build the body by the right exercise, the right diet, and yep, the right thought processes. Step two is then eat for the brain. And eating is before exercising. And this is always, I think, a surprise to people who come to a fitness professional because it's like, I thought you were going to give me a workout. (laughs) And I am. But the thing is what we've known is we put the cart before the horse, right? Cliches, I know, but sometimes a cliche just does the job better. We've given you exercise and and then decided, okay, yes, we're we're gonna have to tell you how to eat too because you're you're overcompensating or you know, we've all done that, right? Started an exercise program, but then decide, oh, I deserve this because I exercise today and it kind of backfires, right? So we did get it. You know, in those 34 years I've been in fitness, we started to understand we also have to coach you a little bit on what what are you eating? Because to come in through drive through is not gonna help you. Right? But what we really decided is exercise helps after you've got the food in place because you eat three to five times more a day, depending on whether you're snacking or not. And I'm not suggesting you snack, but know that it's out there. But really you make about 200 decisions a day around food and you make far less around exercise. You may choose what to wear when you're going, who you're going with, what it is you're going to do, how many minutes, how long. There are more than you know one decision about to exercise or not. But around food, there is you know what am I going to eat? How much? How big is my plate? What's the color of my plate? What's the color of my walls? What's do I put the food on the table or leave the food in the kitchen and dish it up? There are so many more decisions made around every single meal and every single snack that it amounts to about 200. That's according to Brian Wasink. Um, And some of you will recognize his name. He wrote um, Mindless Eating. Mindless, not mindful. And uh, great book, by the way, if you're interested. Full of studies, but not geeky. Very, very user, reader friendly. So step one was train the brain. Step two is eat for the brain. And then step three, finally... Once you've improved your hormone balance from eating the right foods, and yes, it's very possible, then we start moving for the brain. And we can do these things simultaneously. It's not that I'm going to wait you know, a week or two weeks before I have you move working with anyone in a group program or privately. But then we can really get down deep and make results happen. We boost your cognitive function instead of giving you brain drain. If you have been on that hour of power program where you're always doing an hour of cardio or think you've got to do an hour of weight training or it's about time in any way, it's time to shift that because those kinds of things actually drain your brain and they start to trigger more cravings, more fatigue, not better rest and or eating. So it's a lot like this. So think about the Wizard of Oz, just for a moment. So I know that almost almost everyone here very likely has watched The Wizard of Oz once or more than once. It used to be an annual event at our house, and I think I, I have a DVD. I still watch it. But this is one of my favorite scenes. You remember when Dorothy and the Tin Man and the Lion, they all finally got to the front door at the Emerald City after that long, long trip. And they knock on the door, And he opens it up and here's their story. And he says, no way, no how are you getting in to see the wizard and don't come back. Boom, he slams the door. So they all turn around and look at each other. And, you know, if you remember the story, they had to go away and do something and get the right information and bring it back. And as soon as they had that in their hand, He opened the door and he said, well, why didn't you say so in the first place? And they threw the doors open and welcomed them inside, right? So having the right information, just like you, if you've been on a long weight loss, weight gain roller coaster for years, the wrong information is what you had. And you've got to show up first with the right information. What is the right way? to eat? What is the right way to exercise? What is the right mindset? And how do I wrap my 
my mind around it. And notice I just changed the order because you've got to have the facts about how do I balance my hormones through what I'm eating and or what am I doing now that's imbalancing them and how can I balance my hormones better through exercise as opposed to what I might be doing now that might be causing imbalance. And once you have that information, then you have to grab it with your brain because there will be habit gravity. That's what I call, you know, having had something in your head for 20, 30, 40 or more years, it is hard to change, even though logically it makes sense. And that is where having an accountability partner, having a coach, having a group and a community surrounding you to say, oh my gosh, here's my resistance. I I can't do this. I'm trying to cut calories. And so allowing other people to hear you and let them support you when they're catching you in a mistake or with that irrational thinking. It's called limiting beliefs, right? So once you do have the right information, you still may default to those limiting beliefs. So you've got to have both. You have to have the right information so you can run in the right direction, but then you have to have the support so that you can stay there on track. Think about your GPS, right? So if you've got a GPS in your car or on your phone, it will tell you, right, that you've taken a wrong turn and that you need to take a a U-turn. And yet, you know, a lot of us, when we fail at an exercise program or a diet or it doesn't go the way we think and we allow ourselves to think we failed, we yell at ourselves. We call ourselves lazy or lack of discipline. I don't have any willpower. I can't do this. You know, but imagine if the GPS did that to you, right? They're, they wouldn't sell very many of them. Right? If she yelled and she screamed and she said, oh my God, you're so stupid. You have no willpower. I mean, your GPS would not probably last very long. And yet we kind of do that to ourselves. We beat ourselves up. We're not very nice to ourselves when things don't go well. So I have a program designed to be your support, to be your community. And if any of this resonates, you feel like you've been on the wrong path, you've been trying, you've been doing what you thought were the right things, but clearly they are not working now. Registration for Fit You is open right now. Fit You is an eight-week course. It really ends up being nine because there's a preliminary set of information to address the mindset to help you do a pantry raid so that you know what are the right things to have here and what are the things that if you're bringing into your house, planning to eat them, because that's why they get there, will sabotage you. And once you know that in week nine or week, the countdown, if you will, week one of a nine week program, then the other eight weeks become a little bit easier. I have a limited number of 50% off spots right now. So when those are full, then it will go up to full rate. The rate of the program is $4.97 for the eight weeks of the programming, for the ninth week of the pre-program calls, recordings that get you going and, and all that's included in that. And you can read more at flipping50.com forward slash fit you. And it's really intended for people who have women, particularly, who have 20 or more pounds to lose because you're such a unique group. You have unique needs. Most likely you've been at a place of wanting to lose before and it's just not working. And I've had people go through the program more than once who second pass, you know, they're picking up more information even though, you know, very similar, they're hearing the recordings, the videos, and the programming. So realize that you have the links, and you will go all the way through the program. You will have those to go back to should you keep them, right? So you'll receive everything via emails once a week when you get started. And immediately, you'll get the bonus information within about 24 hours so that you can start preparing and you can join the private Facebook group. So registration right now is open. When those 50% off spots are full, they're full. So full registration is $4.97. That's for eight weeks. And let me tell you what I've done. 
with this current program that I've got, I just changed it. I was meeting four times with all the program people. So you're getting private coaching in a group setting in this fit you program. And I have just recently changed it. So I am going to jump into a Facebook live with you as a group collectively every week for eight weeks. So as you go through this program, you need consistent and predictable and regular frequency of support. And I know that and it's really important to me. So what I'm doing is cutting the rate by 50% and increasing your contact with me by 50%. So I think that's pretty fair and I hope you'll agree. But when these are gone, they're gone. So I want you to know it's important if you're ready to do this now. And I want to just call your attention to this simplicity here. People who want to change will. And if you're not ready to change, if right now what's bubbling up for you is, you know, this is not a good time of year. I'm really busy. I'm going to be traveling. I'm going to have company. Um, it's the holidays. It's summer summer holidays. We're going to be at the lake. We're going to be in Switzerland. I don't know. <laughs> we all have our things, but life is not convenient. So if you think back, I mean, if you've had kids, if you bought a house, if someone you love passed, there is never a convenient time for anything meaningful or worthwhile in our lives. And the thing that won't move you it won't move you off of your square one if that's where you're at, is this, but I'm going to say it anyway, that disease does not wait. And unfortunately, while maybe you're in a stressful time and it feels like this is not a good time to start, I would argue with you that this is the best time to start because life is a mess. And learning how to cope when things are on a roller coaster is really one of the best things you can do. You want to make sure that you're offsetting cortisol and the negative effects of stress. So if you can look at it that way through that frame, I think you'll agree now is the best time. And if you know you could choose a busy and stressful time in your life, and I said that would be the ideal time to actually start as opposed to waiting until it's smooth sailing, Think about how that resonates with you because that's the way I coach. Real life is a freaking mess right? or flipping mess if you prefer. And so learning to embrace that and be okay with it and develop a little sense of humor around it is probably our ticket to survival and success. So huge thank you for being here all the way through. If you have questions that maybe I've stirred up with the content here, you can go to flipping50.com forward slash fit you to look further at the program. Just a reminder that the register now for 50% off spots is still here, but when those fill, they fill. So I won't offer any additional for this particular program. You can still register. It's just that that 50% off will not be there. So as soon as we fill them, we'll turn it back up to regular rate. So know that, you know, if you don't see the 249 in one or two payments, you will see the 497 back up and um, get privy to that. So just to sweeten the spot just a little bit for those first registrants for this particular program, you are entered into a drawing for a Nutribullet. Now, if you've won a Nutribullet from Flipping 50 before, you're not eligible because we want to spread the Nutribullet love around. But if you've not won one, then by all means, you are eligible. And we all do better with a friend. So if you have a friend who's in the same boat and you spend a lot of time with, particularly eating or socializing, it will benefit you and her both if you both get involved in the program because you'll have less resistance swimming upstream against people who are not making the changes that you want to make is hard. So having someone near you physically or across the country who might be a sister or a friend will help you make the change. 
So if you bring a friend and let me know, here's my friend's name, I know she registered, I will do a private coaching session with the two of you. What will happen is when you both register and you send to me, here's my friend, we did it, I will send you a link to a conference line. So wherever you are in the world or your neighborhood, you each will call in on your own phone and we will all three be on the phone in the same time, like in the same classroom. I will do a coaching session with you and given that, we'll talk about how you can support each other and we can set up accountability partners for you, how you'll support each other, how you might sabotage each other. I'm hoping that's not true, but you never know. And you know where your strengths are. Maybe one of you is a stronger exerciser than the other. Maybe one of you is stronger in the kitchen or can you each make a healthy soup and then swap them? So now you have two soups for the week or you know, and if you're in the same neighborhood, that works great. If you're across the country, a different form of accountability, but I will do a private session with you. And that is the value of $300 an hour that I typically charge for private clients. So take advantage of that. You've got the registration right now for 50% off. Your friend would get that too if she got in right away and took those spots. You could both get into a drawing for a Nutribullet and you will definitely get. It's not a win or a drawing. It is. If you bring a friend, I will do a private consult with both of you. So there you go. Jump in. Bring me your questions if you're not already on our Facebook page at facebook.com flipping 50 TV. Please jump in. Come over and talk to talk to me over there. So I hope to see you and hope to see you flipping 50 feeling your best.